This is CBC Here and Now. Tonight, she died in prison more than a year ago. Now, Sky Martin's mother is suing the province, the head of the jail, and the prison psychiatrist. Fire crews in Bay Vert are cleaning up today after flames destroyed a home last night. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. The mother of a woman who died while incarcerated in Clarenville last year is taking the province to court. Natasha Martin is suing over what she calls the wrongful death of her daughter, Sky. She filed the lawsuit in Supreme Court in St. John's earlier today. Here now's Arianna Kelland is live in our newsroom tonight with our top story. So Arianna, who's named in the lawsuit? Carolyn, this lawsuit names the province, the superintendent of prisons, and the prison psychiatrist, David Craig. Now, Sky Martin was only 27 years old when she died while incarcerated at the women's jail in Clarenville. Now, 16 months after her death, this lawsuit raises questions about why she was in segregation, why she was taken off her medication, and why Sky Martin was in prison to begin with. On April 21st, 2018, correctional officers found Sky Martin in her cell, her lips blue, choking on a sandwich wrap she herself had forced down her throat. They didn't realize how serious it was, and by the time they did, it was too late. But what happened before her death is what's under the microscope in this lawsuit. Natasha Martin says the government, the prison, and Dr. David Craig are to blame for her daughter's death. Sky Martin had a lengthy and well-known history with the mental health and justice systems, the two often coming hand in hand. She also had a history of self-harm, and the lawsuit alleges had asked to go to the hospital before her death. The statement of claim alleges that Martin was taken off of her meds by Craig, despite being prescribed medication by another doctor at the Waterford Hospital. The lawsuit alleges that the use of confinement coupled with a lack of medication is what led to Sky Martin's death. There's also blame pointed at staff who the claim says failed to supervise the segregation cell despite it being on video surveillance, alleging it was outrageous, flagrant and in direct contradiction of the law and policy governing prison employees. Natasha Martin says her only daughter's death was preventable had she been provided with proper psychiatric and medical care. The lawsuit also says the government is liable for negligence as it ought to have known Craig's, quote, approach to use of medication, which could result in injury or death. Without Sky Martin, her mother says she has lost a close and loving relationship. And for Sky's now 11-year-old daughter, the loss of love, guidance and companionship. Martin is seeking damages. We'll have much more on this story tomorrow, but tonight we do have reaction from the Department of Justice. This afternoon, the Minister of Justice, Andrew Parsons, send a, sent a statement in part saying that it has been a difficult time for family and friends of Sky Martin. He expressed his condolences and says due to privacy and the now ongoing court matter, it would be inappropriate to comment. Reporting live from the newsroom, I'm Arianna Kellen for Here and Now. Ambulances and paramedics are getting stuck at emergency departments in St. John's. They're supposed to offload patients right away, but the transfer is sometimes taking hours, which stops ambulances from responding to other calls. That's according to internal documents obtained by CBC Investigates. Here and now's Katie Breen has more. Paramedics are trained to act fast. They're supposed to be first responders, but they're being held up at hospitals in St. John's and kept from taking calls. Documents from June recently obtained by CBC say ambulance patients aren't always being offloaded right away. When higher priority cases fill the ER, medics have to wait with the patient they brought in. From frontline workers talking to, this is not uncommon to have a couple of ambulances or several ambulances there in this situation uh, at the same time. So you could have an ambulance from out of town, you could have a couple of our own ambulances from here in the Northeast Avalon that are there in the emergency area. The document states some paramedics have waited as long as four and a half hours at hospital, time they could have been out helping others. Internally, Eastern Health's paramedicine division has expressed concerns that offload delays are lasting longer and happening more often. 
Earl says they're contributing to red alerts when no ambulances are ready on standby to respond to a call. He says the situation is unfair to people who may need an ambulance when one isn't available. And it's also unfair to the paramedics on duty, adding extra pressure. A different level of stress when you know you're standing in the corridor of an emergency department, your radio's telling you there's a medical event or there's a motor vehicle accident, and you know you cannot respond because these women and men want to be able to respond. In a statement, Eastern Health says a new policy is helping. There's a buddy system now. If medics are already waiting at hospital with one patient and another ambulance comes in, one team can take care of both patients so that the other team can go out and be on the ready. Eastern Health says it also schedules as efficiently as possible to make sure that ambulances are ready in emergencies. NAPE, however, says the solution is more resources in emergency departments. Katie Breen, CBC News, St. John's. Well, fire crews are cleaning up in Bay Vert after a major fire there last night. It broke out around 9 o'clock. Four people were home at the time. They all managed to escape uninjured and call for help. The building itself was destroyed. There are no hydrants in the area, and the town's fire chief says that made fighting the fire a major struggle. Police in St. John's have released new photos of the men believed to have robbed a bank at the Avalon Mall earlier this week. Police say this man is responsible for the holdup. They say he went into the bank with a firearm and demanded cash. He then fled on foot with the money. The bank closed while police investigated, but the rest of the mall remained opened at the time. Police are asking for the public's help identifying the men. A young woman posted about the harassment she receives from male customers while on the job. As he was leaving, he put his hand on my shoulder and like went down the side of my chest area and um, he told me to have a nice day. Now dozens of other women are sharing their stories about experiencing the same thing. More on this story coming up. different day out there today for some areas across the province. Here's a look at your daytime highs. Uh, 20 degrees for the West Coast. 22 is the warm spot in Stephenville today and 16 degrees in St. John's. That's 10 degrees difference than what it was yesterday. And then you can see a number of areas seeing temperatures much cooler than what we saw. Now some rain has moved through. And if we zoom in, you can see some of that heavier rain is starting to make its way towards the Avalon. That will continue as we head through the overnight tonight, even looking at the risk of some thunderstorms and then even more of a cool down as we head towards the weekend. But I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, as we can see, Peter Cowan is out in that rain tonight for a fundraiser at O'Brien's Farm in St. John. So, Peter, what's happening there tonight? Carolyn, the plan is to add to this old historic building here, and they've got some big plans. They want to create a new discovery. It's a learning center. They've unveiled those plans tonight, and in fact, they're doing a bit of a fundraiser. It's supposed to be a chef's hike, but with the rain, it's turned into a little more of a garden party. They do fortunately have a tent. We're going to chat with some of the folks here and some of the chefs. It's all coming up tonight on Here and Now. Great. Thanks so much, Peter. I hope you're wearing your rubber boots. Well, lewd comments, crude jokes, even touching by male customers. 18-year-old Jenna Gidge says she's experienced it all while working at a cashier in Mount Pearl, but she didn't realize how common her experience was until her story was posted on Facebook. Now dozens of other women are saying, me too. Here and now, Zach Gowdy has more. There's a man who tries to kiss me, tells people that we're married and have kids. People are like, oh, your body, like I'd like to bend you over. And all the other girls I work with too, it's not, it's not just me. Jenna Gidge is just 18, but she's experienced a shocking level of sexual harassment from behind the checkout counter at a local grocery store. I've been told that someone wanted to kidnap me, uh, take me to their house, make me wear cat ears and whiskers while tied up watching Catwoman. That's one of them. That's a good one. Was that the one that prompted this Facebook post? Uh, no, the one that actually prompted the Facebook post was the man who actually touched me. Uh, I did not serve him at my cash. He was at another cash, but he had stopped, looked me up and down and was like licking his lips and it made me like obviously uncomfortable as you probably would. And I walked away. I walked to another cash in another area where he wasn't and as he was leaving, 
he put his hand on my shoulder and like went down the side of my chest area and um, he told me to have a nice day. I did not have a nice day after that. Gidge's mom got fed up with her daughter's horror stories and posted about them on Facebook. Right away, comments from other women started pouring in. Story after story of women, often in service sector jobs, facing sexual harassment from male customers. Everybody, they read it and they're like, oh, that's happened to me too. The women united will never be defeated. All over the world, women are saying, me too taking a stand against the harassment, misogyny, and violence that men have gotten away with for too long. And while some powerful men have faced consequences, everyday women in everyday workplaces still have little protection. People think, I guess, they're just entitled to come in because we're behind a counter that they can say what they want, do what they want, because they know they're not going to get a reaction from anybody because we're at work, we're in like the polite mindset, we're not going to speak out, but now I think it's coming up that we should, we should speak out. Gidge says it was depressing, but also heartening to see how common her experience truly is. Most of all, she's glad she shared it. I'm so happy that like it, it started something, it started a big conversation and that I've seemed to make a change in some people's lives because they know they're not by themselves when it comes to this. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, Mount Pearl. Earlier this week, PC leader Chess Crosby called for the Auditor General to investigate government's failure to complete methylmercury mitigation measures at Muskrat Falls. The Premier and other officials have said they had planned to cap wetlands but ran out of time. Now documents released under access to information show officials kept forging ahead on the issue even after the deadline passed. Here now's Bailey White has been digging into this and she joins us now. So Bailey, when were officials first alerted? about this deadline. So this happened back in January. It was Gilbert Bennett of Nalcor who sent an email to a deputy minister at the Department of Municipal Affairs and Environment. And he explained that based on the projections and the timelines that they had been working with, the time to do wetland capping had already run out. Now, wetland capping was proposed to help reduce methylmercury contamination in fish, seals, and seabirds. So, you see, when the reservoir is flooding like it is now, vegetation, like the trees and the soil, once on dry land, will become submerged. And when that happens, they start to decompose, and that's when methylmercury is released. So the idea of wetland capping is that if you can cover those areas with rocks, less methylmercury will be released into the greater ecosystem. And what's curious about all of this is that even after Gilbert Bennett sent this email in January, government officials kept talking about wetland capping like it was something that was on the table. So, for instance, in February, there was a, a talking point that says, you know, we're having discussions about maybe we should do some capping. And, and then in March, another memo says we're very close to making a decision. But of course, this January note from Gilbert Bennett would suggest that the decision had already been made for them. So when did this uh, missed deadline actually become public? Well, it didn't become public knowledge until uh, a panel of civil servants was actually asked to come testify under oath at the Muskrat Falls inquiry. So the civil servants are there and it just sort of comes out. It sort of, you know, emerges that this timeline had been lapsed and the deadline was passed. You know, there wasn't a, a news release or a big press conference or anything like that, but this was a highly anticipated announcement. You know, if you go through these documents, there are just letters and letters, especially from Nunazia, but asking if there had been a decision. You know, it's been four months, have you made a decision? It's been 10 months, have you made a decision? Even last month, when government announced that it was giving Indigenous groups the $30 million originally allocated for wetlands capping, the press release didn't say anything about them as deadline or that it was too late to do the work. And by the way, Nunatsiavut has not accepted its share of the cash. It accuses the province of deliberately missing the deadline and trying to pay Indigenous people hush money. Carolyn? Thanks, Bailey. That's CBC's Bailey White.
Well, a big anniversary today for a Labrador tourist site. Red Bay is marking 40 years of being a National Historic Site today. It's where Basque whalers set up a major whaling port back in the 1500s. In 1977, researchers there found the remains of the Basque, and two years later, Ottawa named it a National Historic Site. Today, they're celebrating the milestone with stories, music, and even some Basque finger foods. The site was named a World Heritage Site in 2013. Welcome back, everyone. So it's a bit cooler out there today, for sure, and it's raining out there now. So. Yeah, yeah, we saw some onshore winds, mm -hmm. and uh, that helped keep those temperatures quite cool mm -hmm. today, uh, for at least for most of the Avalon anyway, sitting only in the teens. We'll take a look at those temperatures. 16 degrees was the afternoon high in St. John's, 20 for Badger. We did reach a 20 degree mark for some areas. Stephenville was the warm spot at 22, and still those cool temperatures up through Labrador, 13 degrees was the afternoon high in Lab City. Now, there's those winds I was talking about. Pretty breezy right now as well. Uh, current sustained winds, 26 kilometers per hour, generally out of the south, southeast for uh, St. John's. And we're gonna see these winds continue as we head through the overnight. And uh, those temperatures have dropped just a little bit. So currently sitting at 15 degrees, 18 for Corner Brook, 12 in Happy Valley, Goose Bay. Now, 
That rain started a little bit earlier this afternoon, around 3 o'clock for uh, us in the metro area. Otherwise, we saw those uh, rain showers move in a little bit earlier, heavier at times as well. And we're seeing that head towards the Avalon. Now, as we head through the next couple of hours, that uh, heavy rain will continue and even more so into the evening and overnight. We're seeing that up through Labrador as well, certainly into central and then towards the coast overnight into the early morning hours as uh, some of that heavier rain moves through. And then with this, we could even see the risk of some thunderstorms. So by tomorrow morning, looks like rainfall amounts somewhere between 10 to 20 millimeters. If we do see those thunderstorms develop, these amounts could be higher locally. And then for Lab West and towards Central, those amounts somewhere between 30 to 50 millimeters of rain. So certainly lots of heavy rain on the way tonight. Those temperatures not going to move much from what we're seeing right now, but again have that risk of thunderstorms from Grand Falls, Windsor, down to the Buren Peninsula, as well as the Avalon Peninsula, with those winds uh, staying quite breezy tonight. 11 degrees for St. Anthony, 18 for port -a basque and 16 for Corner Brook. And then up through Labrador, still another chilly night along the coast in the single digits. Lab City sitting at 10 degrees tonight with those breezy winds and Happy Valley Goose Bay sitting around 11. Now tomorrow going to stay unsettled. Some more showers moving through with this also, uh, especially for the northern peninsula or rather the west coast really looking at that risk of potentially some thunderstorms with some of these heavier showers. They're going to move through central by tomorrow afternoon and uh, eventually into Saturday or into the early morning hours as well. We're going to see some more showers move through. So overall, a pretty wet couple of days. By uh, Friday, you're going to add to that amount, again, mainly for the uh, coastal areas where we could see upwards of 30 to 50 millimeters up through Labrador and then the northern peninsula as well. So those temperatures will climb a little bit. So we should sit into the 20, uh, 20 to 23 degree range with uh, that humidity again returning. 26 for Grand Falls, Windsor with that risk of thunderstorms. Have that all the way through to Corner Brook, 25 degrees, gross more and 20 up through the Northern Peninsula, sitting in the teens through the day. And then uh, again, similar forecast for Labrador as we've been seeing for the past couple of days. This cooler weather is going to make its way a little bit further south as we head into the weekend, but it doesn't last very long. The beginning of next week looks pretty lovely, but I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, it's not the greatest weather to be outside right now, but Peter is toughing it out at a fundraiser for the O'Brien Farm. So, uh, Peter, it looks like you have a pretty familiar face there with you right now. Uh, yep, Carolyn, uh, a farm is not normally a place you'd find a comedian. Uh, <laughs> no. What exactly are you useful for here? I have I, I absolutely very little, very little. I am a CBC bait is what I am to get on the news. Uh, well, I am a, the uh, honorary patron, they call it. Which uh, normally I'd expect someone like really old and really rich if, to have a title honorary patron. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm working on my Gordon Pinson status and you have to start early. Uh, and I, uh, we are raising funds for the O'Brien Farm Foundation and I've been here for a while now uh, working with these fine folks. And uh, we are now announcing that the next phase, which is a learning center, um, that we're going to have here where people can come up, learn about farming, learn about uh, sustainable food here in Newfoundland and Labrador because we all know that our soil is as fertile and deep as a tray of kitty litter and that we uh, used to have 90% of the food uh, that we eat, we produce, and now 70% of it might come in if the truck doesn't break down and the ferry gets in. So we're about two to three days away from zombie-like starvation and, and a war, a civil war over Twinkies. But we're going to try and stop that here at O'Brien Farm. You can come up, you can learn about farming, learn about practices, and uh, for new Canadians to come up and maybe grow things that they could grow at home, try and grow it here, etc. And this was the first phase of our new project, the, the Learning Centre. Do you farm? Like, you're pretty towny. You grew up in St. John's, you live oh, yeah. downtown. Well, my mother's people, Mom was a Bell, and her uh, grandmother was an O'Connell from Ireland, and she left the horrible soil and rocky soil that couldn't grow anything of Ireland for a new chance to the New World and came to Newfoundland and realized that she was cursed to never grow anything. So she came here and they were very good friends with the O'Briens. So when I was a kid, we'd come up here and visit all three brothers, but mostly Ali O'Brien. And he would walk me through these fields and he would walk me through his garden and tell me how important it was to grow things and tell me how important it was to have your land and to protect it. And uh, this is a little oasis that he protected against uh, development all around. And we're trying to, to pay that forward and protect it, but also teach other people some of the things he 
try and impart to me when I was a kid. So uh, basically you're looking, the foundation's looking to raise $500,000. I guess this is a good start here. This is a big fundraiser. People have yeah. paid big bucks to come and sample some local food and uh, I understand you led them on a bit of a hike? Yeah, so we have like a, we have wonderful, we have a Mallor Cottage and we have Raymond's and Merchant Tavern and Chinched here and they're doing great stuff, Kitty Vitty Beer and Collingwood Wine and Spirits and then we're taking people through the fields and showing them uh, where different fields were, what they were used for, etc. and having to walk around as well as Thimble Cottage which is uh, a very old structure here where they lived. That's all been that's all been taken care of again. And so we're asking people to help us build our learning center. And we, I was shocked. Uh, the good folks at Pentacon here, who are very char charitable folks, they just came over. Pentacon just gave me a fifty thousand dollar check to get us started that I wasn't expecting. So this is awesome. We'll yeah. make sure it actually gets deposited. Yeah, well, money doesn't grow on trees. You know, we're talking about growing things, but we'll say it's a large check. So I'm going to go down to a, a gro Grok Conf with an oversized uh, uh, ID and try and get it cashed. Well, thank you very much for chatting with me about this. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for coming out. And one of the things we were talking about, of course, is the fact that there is food being served, and a lot of it's including local ingredients. And look who we have here, Jeremy Charles uh, from Raymond's, who's one of the chefs here who's been busy putting together. What, what, kind of, what do you have here? What's the spread? Yeah, we got uh, some beautiful fresh tuna from Conception Bay um, from a good friend of mine out fishing. And uh, so yeah, a little tuna tartare and uh, some fresh herbs, a little bit of chili. And uh, yeah, simple, simple. Can I try it out? Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, again, some beautiful raw tuna, a little bit of salt, canola oil. a little bit of rosé vinegar. So as you're putting this together, how important for you is the cause of growing things locally? Because I know you're a big fan of getting as many local ingredients as possible. Yeah, no, it's super important, you know, for people to start going back to the roots and growing their own vegetables and, and livestock. And uh, it's such a magical place up here, tucked away, you know, and um, to be able to be out supporting this event is it's amazing with friends. And, and uh, yeah, it's a really, Really exciting time, I gotta say. I'm really looking forward to uh, the whole project coming together. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, this is just one of the stations. Uh, they also were serving up shark, locally caught shark, which I was hoping to be able to try a little bit of, but uh, they uh, didn't have a lot of it. So they sold out of that earlier. But local tuna is also something that you don't really get to uh, try with yeah, every day because it's you know, most of the time, if you're in the supermarket, the tuna you're picking up has been caught halfway around the world yeah no this time of year it's pretty pretty amazing we're able to uh, source local tuna fish there's a few guys that are out fishing uh, rod and reel and uh, yeah it's a beautiful amazing product and uh, yeah so here we go Got a little bit of a garlic aioli which is basically a fancy way of saying a garlic mayonnaise <laughs> <laughs> and uh, again cucumber a lot of fresh herbs and uh, yeah, just again simplicity, letting ingredients speak for themselves. You know? A little bit of chili in there as well, so hopefully that doesn't scare. Give you. it a, okay. Well, let me just I'll grab a fork here. Excellent. Well, I'll give it a try here. Let's see. I'm a big fan of tuna, so. Mmm. Delicious. Well, thank you very much for chatting with me and uh, for sharing a little bit of the tuna. You're and uh, I'll let you get back to serving some of the regular guests. Sounds good. Cheers. Thank you. Well, Carolyn, um, I might be able to bring you back a little bit uh, later on. But um, anyway, coming up a little later in the show, we are going to uh, chat with some of the folks a little bit more about that learning center that they have planned. We'll tell you a little bit about the design and uh, what they're hoping to do here. Great. Thanks so much, Peter. That looks delicious. In the beginning, like people did say, you know, like you're off your head, there's nobody out here, and they're certainly not going to pay a dollar for a tea biscuit. <laughs> but boy, were they wrong. More than 70,000 tea biscuits later, this fussy lady's kitchen is a hit. We'll take you to Small Point ahead on Here and Now.
Welcome back to Hearing Now. Well, for the first time in history, a 12-year-old is competing in the CP Women's Open. Right now, Michelle Liu is going up against golfers twice her age. So how does it feel? Ahead of her first round, CBC's Artie Pohl spoke to the young golf pro. Nice swing. The form, Perfect. the drive, the focus. It's all part of the winning recipe that makes Vancouver native Michelle Yu no ordinary eighth grader. Lined up on the range with people who in some cases are twice her age. Liu makes her debut at Canada's National Women's Golf Tournament in Ontario on Thursday. I'm definitely very excited. Um, a little bit nervous too. It's definitely a highlight, I'd say, in my golfing career. A short career so far, but an impressive one. Already she's won two Junior World Championships. It all started when she was just six. The putting prodigy went to a golf camp with her older sister. I mean, at six, I don't really remember that, like, that much, but I'd say that um, I definitely thought it was very interesting because it, there was a ball, there was a club. And here's Michelle at age seven, swinging like a pro. Her coach has been training her from the start. Constantly tell her that she is amazing. There's something special about Michelle. Uh, She's very strong-willed. If she has a bad shot, she can leave it alone and move on to the next shot. Another Canadian Michelle has been following closely, the defending champ for this tournament, Brooke Henderson. She qualified for the Canadian Open when she was just 14 back in 2012. This is the first time in the tournament's 47-year history that there's been a 12-year-old on the course. And her coach says he is seeing a lot of interest from a younger generation and from more diverse communities. The demographic is uh, changing. People that come here from Asia know that you have to work really hard to rise up and be something or someone in that, in that society. And that work ethic is uh, carried over here into golf. For Thursday's first round, Michelle will have an international audience. Her grandma will come from China and her dad will come and her best friend. And while they remain focused on Michelle, the extraordinary 12-year-old will keep her eye on the ball. Arthi Pohl, CBC News, Aurora, Ontario. Well, as I mentioned, Michelle Liu is in the middle of a match right now. She's one of 15 Canadians vying for the national title this week in Aurora, Ontario. Well, throughout the summer, we've been sharing a local segment called Gas and Grab. It features some of your favorite roadside stops across the island. In this latest episode, Chef Andy Bullman visits Small Point in Trinity Conception Bay to meet the Biscuit Lady. We're at the Small Point General Store in Small Point, Newfoundland, and we were told that we had to check out the tea buns. Let's go. We're here at the Fussy Lady's Kitchen with the Fussy Lady herself, Wanda Crocker. I think we're gonna make some tea biscuits today. What ways are you fussy? <sighs> we're just fussy about Everything that goes out here, we want a, a really, really good product. Mm -hmm. And when you put out a, a good product and people start to buy it, then when they come back, they want to see that same good product time after time after time. So it's all right? about consistency. It's all about consistency. So you're fussy, but you're, you're not difficult. Oh, different, no, different. not at all. I'm not difficult. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no comments from the peanut gallery over there. <laughs> but we're not, we're not... <laughs> Wanda's no, we're not are over here forming it's a union. So which of the biscuits do you sell the best, like, sell the most? I would say the raisin is probably the most popular. Okay. We sell a lot of raisins. And I biscuits. noticed a sign on our way in. You guys have sold an astonishing amount of biscuits, huh? and you just count them every time. Is that right? Well, uh, well, the girls is, is just a habit that started in here. Maybe it's because I'm fussy. I'm saying, how much did you get out there today? And I'm trying to figure out: Are we making any money here? Is this is this actually going to happen? Is it going to work? So we, we record everything that we make. Yeah. So once in a, every six or eight months, Peg will say, I'm going to count the biscuits now today. So that's that's what it started as a tradition here. And what number are we at? 
we're at, we're just under 75,000. Guys, that's so many biscuits. So Wanda, how did you end up out here in Small Point? Well, um, I, I bought a summer house out here 32 years ago, it's a long time ago. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I used to work in town, I was a social worker. And every Friday at four o'clock, you pack up the car, you just couldn't wait to get here and come home on Sunday and spend a couple of times in the, a couple of weeks in the summer. And about 12 years ago, I thought, oh, I can't, I just can't leave here on Sundays anymore. Life's too short. Yeah, so I decided I really wanted to live here and I absolutely love this area. Yeah. So you bought the gas station mm -hmm. and you turn it into the Small Point General Store mm -hmm. and the kitchen part, this seems really inspired. This must have felt like a huge risk to you. Well, yes, but I'm, I'm also kind of probably one of the most determined people you'll ever meet. Uh, I, I had this idea that you know, I really want to open a bakery. I want to get some good homemade bread, some old fashioned stuff out of the bakery in there. And in the beginning, like people did say, you know, like you're off your head, there's nobody out here. And they're certainly not going to pay a dollar for a tea biscuit. But I thought, no, no, I know I can do it. And we were persistent. And, you know, uh, I think we've done it. All right, well, the sun is shining. It's a beautiful day for a beautiful bun. I'm looking forward to this. Have one? All right. Now, get the height. Cheers. Let's open oh, her up. So good. Oh, man. Beauty, beauty, beauty. I am glad that you're so fussy. <laughs> this is a thing of beauty. We've gone inside at Thimble Cottage here at O'Brien Farm. This is the old historic part of the farm, but we're going to be talking about something new they have planned. That's coming up next on Here and Now. Welcome back. Well, let's head out to uh, O'Brien Farm again in St. John's where Peter Cowan is right now, all cozy, warm inside. Uh, how's it going out there now, Peter? 
Carolyn, it is much better here inside where it's warm and rain free. And uh, I'm here with Shani Duff, who's the chair of the committee and you the board as well. Yes. The Conference Foundation Board. Lots of chairs here. And, <laughs> yes. and you were actually saying it was kind of amazing how many people did turn up considering yes, the weather has not been great for an outdoor yeah. event. But you were talking about building a new indoor space, and that's this new learning center. Yes, it is. What's, why do you need to add new facilities here at the O'Brien Farm? Because we want the farm to be not only part of history, which is where we are now and what we have already done, which is restore this cottage, but we want it to be part of the history of farming in Newfoundland and where it's going in the future. I personally think that farming has been a very much underestimated I, in, industry in Newfoundland. We think of ourselves oftentimes as a fishing community or a mining community, but agriculture is a base. You don't live unless you have food to eat. And so I thought that story needed to be told. And then we realized that it started here in the Northeast Avalon when a very wise governor in the early 1800s decided to give land grants to 300 farmers or people who might want to farm. And the O'Briens were one of them, the people who owned and, and, and uh, actually worked this farm until Allie died. Allie O'Brien was the last surviving member of that particular family. And yet nobody knew a whole lot about that and the fact that Newfoundland would never have become a settled community unless there were people who were farmers. You, you know, you, you can't you can't exist on, if you don't have, have something to eat. So um, part of the motivation was to tell that story, but the other part was we have 30 acres of land. This has lined fallow now for many years since Allie died, and we thought that it's in the middle of the city, it's a beautiful site, and it has the potential to make a real contribution to sustainable farming in this province. And the way we want to do it is, you know sustainable farming is an issue now, and there are a lot of people here who actually have a huge knowledge base, and it doesn't, you know, it could be about keeping hens, it could be about bees, it could be about backyard farming, it could be about organic farming, but there, there is that knowledge base, and we want to be a hub where we can marry that knowledge base with the growing interest in sustainable farming and, and agriculture and people who want to learn. So that is why we want to create this center so that we can become a hub that will marry those who want to know and care about this whole issue of sustainability and those who actually have the skills but perhaps don't have a place where you can have that dual experience. You can have a classroom, but you can also get your hands dirty and have a farm where you can, you can work while you learn. So when are you hoping to be able to break ground here? This fall. Now that's why we're trying to raise this money. We already have $800,000 from grants from the province and the COA. We need to raise 500,000 more so we can meet the actual cost of what we're talking about. And it's not only a physical building, it is putting this farm back to work. And that means agricultural infrastructure, it means tractors, it means sheds and barns, and it means equipment. So that to get this farm working again in the way I wanted to work, which is being part of the future of farming in our province. We need $500,000, and that's why we're on a capital campaign. Well, good luck with it, and thank you so much for telling me why this is such an important thing for you. Well, I'm very happy to talk to you because that's what we want to do. We know we have an awareness gap, and people say, well, over on farm, where is that? Well, I hope that after this week and this event, they will actually know where we are and what we need to do and what we want to do. Okay, well, and that is Shani Duff, who's chair of both the board and the campaign to get the new facility built. And that's it from me up here at O'Brien Farm. And uh, I got to go out and see if I can find any more of that food. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Peter Cowan for Here and Now. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Well, now to Prince Edward Island, where a soccer team has added an extra skill to their training. They're not just practicing kicking and passing. This team is doing yoga. Nicole Williams dropped by for a practice. Exhale, bring it back to the center. One more time, inhale, open it up. It's something you don't usually see on the soccer pitch, a team of young people doing yoga. But it's what the Sherwood Rangers under 13 boys premier team have been doing every Monday night since last summer. The team's coach, Jack Wheeler, decided to introduce it last year, noticing the boys were getting easily distracted. They come to the soccer field, 
some of them weren't focusing on what was going on in the game. They were talking to each other, and I said, how do we get them to focus on just being an athlete? Front knee bends. So now, for 30 minutes once a week, the boys stretch, lunge, and breathe in deep, much of the time using a soccer ball, and at the core of their lesson, learning how to push aside distractions when they're on the field. They're so focused, and I love seeing them um, respond so positively to something that is new to them. And while yoga has improved that focus, Wheeler says it took a little getting used to. The first evening was, they were laughing, they were giggling. Uh, it was new to them and they were a little bit uncomfortable. So by the end of the season, they were buying into it. Keep going, are some of you still at? Still the giggles haven't completely gone away, but Wheeler says yoga practice has meant success on the field. Last year, the Rangers won gold in the Summerside kickoff tournament after starting the playoffs in fifth place. Though it's not just about winning for the team, it's about becoming a better player and teammate. It's good. It helps with like flexibility and like mental stuff. Like if I'm taking like a penalty shot or something, just like focus and stuff. I think I'm more aware of my surroundings and taking my time more whenever I'm making plays and I think it's helping me improve. It's fun starting out and I think I'll get better as it goes along. The team will continue practicing yoga for at least another season and now the Rangers have a new mantra. There was a point we were going into overtime and one of the players said, guys, if something happens, just pull your socks up. Nicole Williams, CBC News, Charlottetown. Welcome back to Here and Now. So raining out there now, and it's going to keep on raining till tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, heavier rain is going to move in for parts of Labrador as well. We'll take a look at the amounts expected. This is tomorrow morning. So by uh, tomorrow morning, we'll see anywhere from 30 to 50 millimeters of rain for parts of Central and Lab West. And about 10 to 20 mils is on the way for uh, the Avalon, Eastern Newfoundland. And then through the day tomorrow, that rain's going to spread further east towards the coast of Labrador and then for the northern peninsula as well. The southern Avalon picking up additional rainfall amounts, uh, which could accumulate to 20 to 30, maybe even uh, 30 to 40 millimeters of rain.
in total from what we're going to see from tonight as well. Uh, so as far as temperatures are concerned, a little bit warmer than what we're seeing uh, or what we saw today in the mid to high 20s with that risk of thunderstorms again for the west coast towards central by the time the early evening or late afternoon and uh, up through St. Anthony still sitting around 16 degrees. So you're going to see those cooler temperatures and then Labrador as well. Uh, staying cool 12 degrees for Lab City. Single digits along the coast and those winds will shift out of the northeast somewhere between 30 to 50 kilometers per hour through the day. Now, uh, as we head overnight into Saturday, things are going to see another round of rain move through for the Avalon and then staying generally cloudy through the day on Saturday. But we start to see that wind shift and you can see that wind shift bringing that northerly wind in and that's going to cool things down. Uh, eventually things will clear out for Labrador. That's the start and you'll see clearing trend. That's the start for what looks like the beginning of next week is actually going to be quite nice. So here's your temperatures for Saturday, Saturday morning in parts of the uh, region. We'll see very cool. So somewhere between uh, three to maybe even four or five degrees and then into the teens. So that's the afternoon highs for Saturday. Again, we'll see some clearing trends as we head towards the weekend. So once we are towards next week rather. So once we get through this cool, it will warm up quite nicely. And as of now, it looks like we'll see plenty of sunshine both on Sunday, Monday and Tuesday with those temperatures slowly climbing back up to the seasonal range. Now for central Newfoundland, same thing. There you go, 12 degrees on Saturday, overnight low five degrees and then 22 by Sunday. But again, plenty of sunshine. And uh, with this, it's a westerly wind, so it's not going to be quite as humid as well. So certainly lovely. And then for eastern Labrador, 24 degrees by Saturday. And look at your temperatures, 26. Tuesday looks beautiful as well. And then that's the case for western Labrador. So over the next couple of days, probably going to sound like a brokered record as far as that sunshine goes, but it's certainly welcome as we see a return of that sunshine. So when I come back, I will have a look at your weather photo, Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. Well, the best known shipwreck in history is being consumed by the ocean. The Titanic continues to deteriorate about 4,000 meters down at the bottom of the North Atlantic. These are the first new pictures of the wreck in nearly 15 years. They show bacteria eating away at the metal. Some parts have actually disappeared. A team of experts is studying the images to assess how long it'll be before the Titanic is fully lost to the sea. 1,500 people died when the Titanic hit an iceberg and sank in April 1912, about 600 kilometers south of Newfoundland. I want to know where you're too. I think this photo is uh, a good one. Eugene Howell sent us this photo. I'll tell you where this was taken when we come back after the break.
welcome back. Animals at the London Zoo are throwing their weight around. It's an annual ritual that helps the zookeepers care for the creatures. In total, we've got over 19,000 animals and we've got just over 560 different species. It's the annual weigh-in at the zoo. It'll take about a week to get the animals onto the scales in a general check of their health. Weight can provide information about things like pregnancies and help determine appropriate doses of medication. Zoo staff often treat, give treats to coax the animals like these penguins onto the scales. Others like the South African porcupine don't seem to mind and neither do the meerkats. I would like that job. That's a great job. <laughs> Can I have that job, please? I know. It sounds like a lovely job. It'd be nice to work at a zoo. I wouldn't want. Not the snakes, though. The snakes, no. I'm good without those. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a lovely water photo yeah. that I want to share with you. This photo uh, was taken in Northern Bay Sands. So something we're pretty familiar with. We've seen uh, quite a few photos there. And uh, Eugene Howell sent us this photo, and he said that it's the first time that the river has gone all the way across. Interesting. At least uh, that's what they say. Okay. It's I gone wonder. halfway across before, but uh, never all the, all way, the way across. Way. Hmm. So I interesting. What's causing that? Could it be the rainfall? Could or? be. Yeah. No idea. Hmm. But uh, yeah, interesting. And it's a great shot there. Yeah. Uh, everybody's enjoying the river at the beach <laughs> <laughs> yeah it looks like a lot of fun for sure yes. thank you so much to eugene for sending that and if you have any pictures that you would like to share with us send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca all right that's it for us thanks so much for watching everyone have a great night good night